We'll be looking today, as mentioned, at uh, Job chapters 5 and 6. And so uh, I chose to simply uh, um, call this, this particular uh, portion of our study, Aliphaz argues and, and Job responds. And so beginning at verse 1, I'll read chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, and we'll get into our study. Job chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 7, Aliphaz argues and Job responds. Call out now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man, and envy slays the simple one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety. They are crushed in the gate. There is no deliverer. Because the hungry eat up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns. And a snare snatches their substance, for affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Now, as we've seen, Job has opened his heart, and he's made it clear that he's going through tremendous pain. And as we were looking at some of the things Job said, he had, he had said that he wished he had never been born, he went on to say, I wish I would have died at birth. His pain, his humiliation has, has driven him to despair, and he wants all of this to be over. In chapter 3, verses 20, and 20 through 22, it says, Why is light given to him who's in misery and life to the bitter of soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and search for it more than hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they can find the grave in Job chapter 3, verse 26, he closed his opening complaint by saying, I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Well, after Job openly revealed his despair, one of his friends began to correct him, Eliphaz. And Eliphaz told Job that, that while well, Job, you've comforted others, but you ought to take your own advice. Eliphaz seemed to be saying that Job was suffering because he deserved to suffer. In chapter 4, verse 7, he said, remember now, Whoever perished being innocent. In chapter 4, verse 8, he said, Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. In other words, Job, you obviously are simply reaping what you've sown. You may think that you don't deserve what you're suffering, but you are a sinner. He said in chapter 4, verse 17, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? You are actually getting less than you deserve. Who are you, he's saying, to complain in the way that you are? And so he continues to rebuke Job. That's what we're seeing in chapter 5. He's continuing pouring out his rebuke for Job. And that's why in verse 1 he says, Call out now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? I, I just told you that I received a spiritual revelation concerning you. I told you that you, in comparison to God, are nothing. You're nothing like, you're nothing at all. You're like a weak moth. Can you find a righteous person, even one, who will take your side and agree with you? If you've turned away from God, what aid can you hope for? Who can help you? In verse 2, wrath kills a foolish man. Envy slays a simple one. Your insistence that you're innocent will only provoke more wrath to come upon you. You need to humble yourself under the hand of God. You need to receive your chastening. In verse 3, I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly... I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety. They're crushed in the gate. There is no deliverer. I've seen the unrighteous living comfortably and prospering, thinking they're secure. They thought their future was settled, but in a moment it was all taken from them. He thought it was safe. He thought it would remain rich. But I saw and said that he would lose everything. In verse 4, he lost his possessions and he lost his children. Just like you have. In verse 5, he says, Because the hungry eat up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns, and a snare snatches their substance. He, like you, has lost everything. He, like you, has gone hungry. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Bad things don't result from simple natural causes, Job. The things you're experiencing are from God. And you are simply reaping the consequences of your sin. He says in verse 7, man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. 
It is natural for sparks to fly upward, and it is also natural for man to sin and be judged. So he's saying, you've been cut off. You are now without help. In verse 2, he was saying, your way of life has led you to your own hurt, and you're deserving what you get. In verse 3, I've seen people like you who at first prosper but end up losing everything. In verse 4, a wicked person can't have children who dwell in safety. That's why yours died. Verse 5, wicked people lose their wealth, which is why you lost yours. In verses 6 and 7, you're only getting what you deserve because, Job, when it's all said and done, you're just a sinner. In all of this, there is absolutely no concept of a righteous man who could suffer. He goes on in verse 8 to say, but as for me, I would seek God. And to God, I would commit my cause, who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. So now he's giving his righteous advice. Seek God for forgiveness, Job. If I were you, I would confess my sin. I would humble myself before God. I would pour out my concerns to him. I would ask for relief from my pain. You see, in verse 10, he gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. God is benevolent. He provides for us. This is seen in the fact that he sends the rain. This reveals that he's good, that he cares for us and for our needs. In verse 11, he sets on high those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. And so it continues. He cares for us. The best thing to do is humble yourself before him. If you do, God will forgive you. So his thought is this. You've lost everything because of sin, so confess it. And humble yourself. In verse 12, he frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. He, he catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. Evil men put great value on their plans, but God keeps them from succeeding. In verse 13, when it says he catches the wise in their own craftiness, he's saying those who are worldly wise may trust in their own carnal wisdom but God frustrates them and their plans. It's like what it says in Psalm 715, they dig a deep, a deep pit to trap others and fall into it themselves. In verse 14, they meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime as in the night. Because they walk in darkness, they run into obstacles that they can't avoid. In verse 15, but he saves the needy from the sword, from the mouth of the mighty, and from their hand, so the poor have hope, and injustice shuts her mouth. And so he, he's saying God reveals himself to be the protector of those who are defenseless. And when people make accus accusations against the needy, it's God who shields them. So humble yourself and admit you are needy. Behold, verse 17, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, don't despise the chastening of the Almighty. For he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. At this point, he's beginning to soften. He's saying, well, perhaps this isn't just punishment. Maybe this is chastisement. A at any rate, humble yourself. God will restore you. He's saying, Job, God is chastening you. Repent, and he'll once again work with you. And as he's doing this, and you need to know that he, he has no idea really what is going on in the life of Job. He just has all of this wonderful counsel. He goes on to list various things that a righteous man will be delivered out of. In verse 19, he shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he shall redeem you from death. In war, from the power of the sword, you shall be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. You shall not be afraid of destruction when it comes. You shall laugh at destruction and famine, and you shall not be afraid of the beasts of the earth, for you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You shall know that your tent is in peace. You shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. You shall also know that your descendants shall be many and your offspring like the grass of the earth. You shall come to the grave at a full age, as a sheaf of grain ripens in its season, behold, this we have searched out. It's true. Hear it and know for yourself. 
And so he begins to speak concerning the things that are supposed to happen. This isn't a set number, by the way. It's intended to communicate, communicate that God supports us in everything. And his counsel is that God will keep you from being destroyed by troubles. Well, here we go. Thank you for your wise advice, but let's think about that for a moment. Is it true that the righteous never suffer? Is it true that all of these things are always going to take place? That the minute you gave your heart to Christ, all problems were out the door. You never had another bad day. You never had another sad moment. Is that true? Because, boy, these are great promises that Aliphaz is making and all. And so I think about this, and, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll share a few things about this. And the first thing is this. The righteous often suffer. And it's not always due to God chastising us. In Psalm 34, 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. We do have afflictions, but we also have one who delivers us. We are not uh, always secured against them. We go through them. Jesus said it like this in John 16, 33. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, the apostles said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. You see, the righteous do go through chastisement, yes. The righteous do go through pain, yes. The righteous do have afflictions, yes. That's all true. Our God is on our side, and the things we go through, we do go through, but they're never, ever without a cause, and they're never, ever without a purpose. And I've been reading my Bible for a while, and I've discovered that the suffering that the righteous endure produces eternal benefits. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul said it like this. He said, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. There is always a benefit that takes place. Now, suffering affects people in different ways. Some people hate it so much that they immediately blame God and turn away from him. They're the ones who get so hurt and so upset and so disappointed, and, and they wonder, why, Lord, have you allowed this to take place in my life? I've tried so hard. I've done so much. I thought for sure you would safeguard me against this, and you haven't. Like when Job said, that which I feared most has come upon me. And there are those who, when they go through a time of pain and affliction, that they immediately get mad at God. They begin to blame the Lord for what they're going through. And it, it's, it, it, it's an interesting thing, but, but it's true. People can get in the habit of, of, of blaming the Lord for even the smallest thing. When I was uh, a young believer, I got saved at the age of 20. I was still a young believer when I was 23 years old, and I got out of the military. I got out of the army, and uh, I had saved some money for the two years that I was in. And when I saved up my money, I decided I would spend it on a few things. And one of the things I, sa I spent my money on was a, I got a Volkswagen. I bought a car. And then the second thing that I spent my money on was a, uh, a, a motorcycle. I bought a Harley Davidson, a Sportster. They call it a girl's bike, but I liked it. And so I, I enjoyed that motorcycle. And uh, I've shared this with you before, but it comes to mind because I was very quick to blame the Lord about even the most inconsequential things. And, and I was, you know, I, I was going to go to school and they made me cut my hair and I had been out of the army for, for a while, so I'd allowed my hair to grow long again, and I actually preferred my hair long. But now I have to get it cut because I was going to Biola, and Biola had haircut regulations at that time. Interesting, but it did. And so that the, the university did, and so I had to get a haircut. So I went to this place that I had gotten my haircut before, before I'd gone into the military, and he'd done a good job on it. So I thought, well, I'll go. And get my hair cut there, and I drove my motorcycle. It was in Whittier, and I went to this, this uh, barbershop and all, and I walked in, and I said, I want my hair short on the top, you know, trim it around the sides. You know, and I'm expecting just a, a basic haircut. That's what I'm expecting. 
And I'm just sitting there, and I had shoulder length hair, and now he's cutting it off. And when he turned me around, and I looked at myself in the mirror, you know how they smile and say, how's it look? I was real mad um, because, see, before I, before I became a Christian, uh, this is, I'll take another moment to give a little more information. I was what they called a continental, and a lot of you probably don't even know, Ronnie, you're nodding your head, you know what a continental is. You know, you wore your hair kind of swoopy and back and cool, and you hairspray it, it's so much hairspray that it's like a helmet. I didn't even... You know, it's like a helmet. Well, that was then. Now I became a surfer, then I became a hippie, and and now I just want a regular haircut. But when I turned around, suddenly I was once once again looking like I was a lowrider. Not that that's bad, but that wasn't my look. And as I'm looking at myself, I had the it my my hair looked like if you know what a '53 Chevy looks like. That's what my hair looked like. It was like that, and I'm staring at myself. I was so mad, I couldn't even see straight. I gave him his money. I climbed on my motorcycle. I drove home. I went to the, the sink, and I washed my hair, you know, 10 pounds of hairspray out of my hair, and I combed it, and it just stood straight up. And I'm looking at myself. I look like Woodstock, that little bird in Charlie Brown. And I jumped on my motorcycle, and I was yelling in my heart at God. And I still remember what I was saying. I was saying, I can't even get a haircut. Not even a stinking haircut. I mean, just, uh, why can't you let me just get a stinking haircut when I dropped my bike? I was powering around, uh, the, taking a right turn. I powered from first into second. I hit some oil. The bike spun out. I went flying off the bike. It landed on top of me. And I still remember the voice of the Lord in my heart saying, don't yell at me. I had this thing about everything. Look at I've tried hard. I'm doing my best. I'll come. And I would complain against God easily all the time. Blaming God for everything. Never seeing that perhaps I was reaping consequences or never seeing that he was using this to teach me the lessons I've been praying for. Have you ever prayed for patience? Stop. No, have you ever? And then what happens? Or have you ever prayed, God, help me to love people? And then what happens? Because what happens normally, at least in my life, this isn't something I'm teaching happens to all, but in mine, Lord, I, I need patience. I find myself in places where my patience is being tried. And I have to actually get stretched and broken and grow. And then I realize that's the answer to my prayer. Or, Lord, I want to learn to love people. And the Lord allows people into my life that are difficult for me to love. You get married. No, you, you have children. And the thing that you're asking for comes in a different way. It's almost as if I thought that when I said, Lord, please help me to love, that suddenly he just would, you know, pour love on me, and I just would, and it didn't happen that way at all. I went through things. I went through meeting people that were difficult, that made me fall on my knees, to be honest with you, and say, God, help me. This person is difficult for me. God, help me. I, I, I want to be more than I am, and look at how I'm, but I had to learn to do that, because when I first got saved, I'm telling you, I would blame the Lord for everything. I would get angry at God for the most simple thing. For the most simple thing, a haircut, or when I got my car painted and I'm putting the bumper back on and it slips out of my hand and slices the new paint that I had gotten done at Earl Scheib for $19.99. <laughs> you know, sometimes people get upset at God and some people will turn away from him when they're going through pain. Some people will think God must not love me. I must have been bad. I'm being punished. There's a lot of people who think that way. But there are others who receive instruction from it. They actually grow. In Hebrews 12, 11, it says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. 
Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who've been trained by it. Lord, I want righteousness and I want peace and I want to be trained in whatever way is necessary. You see, through his suffering, Job is going to grow. He's going to grow in his, his faith. He's going to grow in his love for the Lord. Because those are areas of his life as, as well as areas of our own that the Lord fine-tunes. What do I learn through afflictions? If you take notes, you might want to note these things. What are some of the things that we learn? One is patience. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. We grow in patience. Joy. In Psalm 30, verse 5, his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. So through that patience and our waiting, we experience joy. We grow in knowledge. Psalm 94, verse 12, Blessed is the man you discipline, O Lord, the man you teach from your law. So we grow experientially. We know things of the Lord through his discipline. And then we grow in maturity. In 1 Peter 5, verse 10, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Suffering refines our lives. We're purified through it. In Psalm 66, verses 10 through 12, For you, O God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison, laid burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. So the suffering refines us. We grow in our patience and joy, our knowledge and maturity, and we're refined. And that's what's happening to Job. His faith in the Lord is being refined. He's growing, and he's suffering. And as he was suffering, remember, his friends had traveled many miles to see him. And Job had opened his heart. And Job had, had spoken out his complaint, the complaint of his soul. And as we saw again, Aliphaz didn't understand we saw that Eliphaz began to correct him. Eliphaz believed that Job had sinned. That had led to the loss of his children and the loss of his wealth. And he believed that God was correcting Job because of some hidden sin. And with all of this being said, Job now replies. And he begins by giving a justification for his grief. In chapter 6, verse 1, Job answered and said, Shut up, Eliphaz. No, Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid with it on the scales. And then, for then, it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words have been rash. He's saying, try to understand my sorrow before you correct me. Try to understand my pain before you blame me. Balance my grief with my calamity. I'm not exaggerating. Though I have been rash, I have been hasty in my speech, but I've been weighed down with sorrow. You see, Ecclesiastes 5.2 says, Do not be rash with your mouth. Let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. God is in heaven, you on earth, therefore let your words be few. So he says, I have been rash, I've been hasty in my speech, but it's come because I'm weighed down. He says in verse 4, the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. I feel like God has used me as a target. He's shooting me with poisoned arrows. And his arrows have been dipped in the cup of his wrath. And they're torturing me, not from the outside. They're torturing me from within. He says in verse 5, does the wild donkey bray when it has grass? Does the ox low over its fodder? Do animals complain when they're peacefully feeding? Animals don't complain when they're in comfort. Why don't you understand my pain? Can, verse 6, can flavorless food be eaten without salt, or is there any taste of the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. They are as loathsome food to me. Flavor, 
when I read, can flavorless food be eaten without salt? How many of you have eaten beans without salt? Maybe you like them. I don't, you know. And I understand that from that perspective, flavorless food. But what is he saying? He's saying your advice is tasteless. It lacks substance. I cannot digest what you are saying. And so he says in verse 8, Oh, that I might have my request that God would grant me the thing that I long for, that it would please God to crush me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off. Then I would still have comfort. Though in anguish, I would exult. He will not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. He states that he longs for what he believes to be his impending death. Now remember in chapter 4, in verses 8 and 9, as well as verse 20, Aliphaz had threatened Job with death as a punishment. It, it says in Job chapter 4, verses 8 and 9, Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same, by the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. Then he had gone on in verse 20 to say, They are broken in pieces from morning till evening. They perish forever with no one regarding. And so Aliphaz threatened Job with death as a punishment. So Job is saying, this isn't a threat. It's a welcome relief to my suffering. Now, I need to hasten to say Job is not what you would call suicidal. Remember, he was already advised by his wife, curse God and die. He never did that. But he does welcome the thought of being with the Lord. Later on, we're going to see it more developed when he says in chapter 19, uh, verses 25 through 27, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the, in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. So he was not suicidal at all. He didn't curse God. He's simply saying that death would be a relief to me because the pain I'm going through is so hard to bear. In Philippians, Paul said it like this in chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. Paul said, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. It's not hopelessness. It says, I know my Redeemer lives. I know that when I take off this shell, I'll be with him. I will see him. I, I, I long for the release of the pain I'm going through. I need relief from this. He says in verse 10, Then I would still have comfort, though in anguish I would exult. He will not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. If I died, I would have comfort. My pain has been ended. Notice in verse 10 how he says, I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. That word concealed carries with it the connotation of disowning, rejecting. I haven't disowned the words of God. My hope is founded on the fact that I have not cursed God and I have not denied him. I have openly acknowledged him. I have not been ashamed of him. In Psalm 40, verse 9, it says, I, I have told all your people about your justice. I have not been afraid to speak out as you, O Lord, well known, well know. One of the things that I think we need today, I might say it like this, is we need more, more Christian believers to be more vocal about their faith. There are quite a number of, of believers who do have a sincere faith in the Lord, but keep it to themselves. They're not opening up their mouth to share. They're not speaking the truth to those who are in need of it. I'd encourage all of us to not be ashamed of his words. I would encourage all of us as a church and as individual believers to be open and available to be used by the Lord to speak when given opportunity to do so. Job is making it very clear that he hasn't concealed God's word. He's making it very clear that he speaks for him. And, and he wants them to know that. He wants them to know, I have been honest about my faith in the Lord. I've openly acknowledged him. I'm not ashamed of him. You know, when you're in a situation when you know that the people around you may be more versed in what they believe than you are and what you believe, that's a very intimidating place to be. 
you know, as a, as a pastor, I've had an opportunity over the years to, to read the Bible, to teach the Bible and all of that. So, so I have a base I'm able to work with. But that doesn't mean that I don't get intimidated or can't get intimidated because I can and I do. Because there are times that you may be speaking to somebody who has a great knowledge of a certain thing you don't know. And you can, you can feel like, what have I got to say to them? They're so polished. They're so eloquent. They're so intelligent. They're so well-versed. They know these things. I don't know anything about these things. And over the years, what I've asked the Lord to do for me, and, and he has been faithful, is as I have asked him to give me words. You know, Jesus, at one point when he was speaking uh, in, in, I believe it's the Gospel of Luke, he, he said, he will give you words and wisdom that none of your enemies will gainsay nor resist. Uh, he speaks concerning it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. And there are times when God will give an answer. The answer is prepared within you. You just don't realize it until you begin to open your mouth and begin to share. And there have been times when I've been with people on planes or whatever, and, and, and they'll ask me on occasion when, I'm, when I've been traveling and, and a stranger is seated next to me. There are times when people have asked me, what do you do for a living? And I always think, well, here we go. This is going to be an interesting conversation. And it's interesting. It really has always turned out to be so. It's always turned out to be interesting. And, and sometimes it's been just really a great conversation where people will ask questions at all. And then sometimes people have gotten, gotten upset. And even without me even saying anything, I remember one woman on a train. My wife Marie and I were on a train. We were doing ministry in, in, on our way to Scotland. And uh, we were on a train. And, and there was a young woman seated next to me. And Marie was sitting across from me. And I'm just sitting there, and the young woman turns to me and begins to speak real friendly, and I, we're having a friendly conversation, you know. And uh, I, I asked her, what are you doing here? What are you doing? She was going to London. I said, what are you doing in London? She says, oh, I, I'm part of a, of a group of people that, 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 that uh, perform in, in bars and, and pubs and all. I said, oh, is that right? Didn't say a thing, just, oh, is that right? She goes, yeah. She says, I sing, and the word that she used is, is B-A-W-D-Y, body. I, I sing body, body bar songs, which means off-color, dirty songs. That's what she's saying. So she says, oh, I sing body uh, bar songs, and what am I supposed to do? So I looked at her and said, oh, really? Sing one for me. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> So I didn't say a thing. What am I supposed to say? We're having a conversation. I'm there just to go. I'm just. I'm. So she, she talks and she's telling me all about her life. And she's from the East Coast, say Massachusetts or whatever. And she's just sharing. And I'm interested. I like to talk to people. And so she went on and on and on for several minutes. And then finally she looks at me. What do you do? <laughs> oh, boy. All I said is I'm a pastor. That's all I said. I'm a pastor. Three words. Immediately, she looks at me and she says, I hate it when people shove their religion down my throat. And I'm going, so I sang a dirty song to her. No, I, I, <laughs> and I looked at her. I, I said, I'm not shoving my, I'm not shoving my religion down your throat but you're shoving yours down mine. She goes, what do you mean? I said, you shove your religion down my throat every day, all day long. What do you mean by that? I never have. I said, oh, your religion is shoved down my throat every time I turn on a television set. Every time I turn on a radio, your religion is shoved down my throat. Every time I drive by a... Uh, a billboard with an advertisement for your alcohol or whatever. You shove your philosophy down my throat. I say, you shove your religion down everybody's throat constantly. But I tell you, I'm a pastor and I'm shoving my religion down your throat. That doesn't make any sense. So she sang a dirty song at me. No, so she just, she just looks at me and I just looked at her and that was the end of our conversation. I was having a nice visit. I, I wasn't judging her. I wasn't. Do any, I wasn't, I didn't pull out my Bible and slap her with it. I mean, I was, I was just sitting there, but that's the way it is in the world. And I learned a long time ago, be prepared, be prepared because 
you should always be prepared to give an answer concerning the hope that lies within you with gentleness, with meekness, with humility. You know, not in an argumentative way, but be prepared. I believe that right now, guys, and I think we'd all agree with this, that it's a time for the church to be prepared to give an answer. Why do we believe the way that we do? What is the purpose of and the benefit of being a Christian? Why does it matter? If it doesn't matter, but if it does, then why does it? And that's why it's a blessing that you come on Wednesday night for Bible studies. So we can look at the word together and we can look at the things and the arguments that are going on with Job and this friend of his who is accusing him. And you can see how Job responds to those kinds of things. You see what he's saying right here is, is, is that I'm really having a very difficult time. Notice verse, verse um, 11 through 13. What strength do I have that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? Is my strength the strength of stones or is my flesh bronze? Is my help not within me and is success driven from me? Uh, what strength do I have? You see, Eliphaz suggested that he might have his former prosperity returned, but he's saying, who wants it in this condition? When he says in verse 12, is my strength the strength of stones? Is my flesh bronze? He's saying, I'm not, I'm not made of stone. I'm not made of bronze. I'm simply flesh and blood. I feel pain. My own strength has, has proven to be not enough. And he says in verse 13, is, is my help not within me? And is success driven from me? All of my internal resources are exhausted. All of my reserves have been used up. I am completely drained. Now, that's something, by the way, that Paul also understood. Trials reveal our weakness. They increase our need for the help of God. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, Paul said, He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says in verse 14, to him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Now he begins to reproach them for lack of sympathy. The one who is being melted by afflictions should be shown kindness and compassion Aliphaz, you have not done so for me. And he goes on to say, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty, you accuse me of lacking fear of God. Even if this were true, you could be kind to me. You could speak truth to me, but do it with love. You see, I'm hurting. I'm thirsty. I'm in need of comfort but you've proven to be empty. Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, a friend loves at all time. A brother is born for adversity. Romans 12, 15 says, rejoice with them that do rejoice. Weep with them that weep. Galatians 6, verse 2 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. When you're hurting, sometimes you're just not ready for the advice and direction that your friends may want to give you. Christians are very, Christians can be very quick to want to fix people without giving them time to heal. I'll say this briefly. We'll see this often. But I say this because it's true. Sometimes the best comfort that I have received, and I'm an old man, and I've gone through a lot of things in my life, has been sympathy without advice. 
I remember going to my own pastor many years ago now, many years ago now, Pastor Chuck, Chuck Smith. Marie and I went and saw him. I wanted to open my heart to him and share with him some pain that I was going through. And I remember speaking to him. And when I spoke to my pastor, I, I told him what had hurt me, what I was hurt over. And yeah, I was hurt. And I was talking to him. I wanted some prayer and some advice. And I'll never forget when I said, this is what happened, Chuck. I'll never forget Chuck groaning. He heard me and he groaned. I'll never forget him going, oh, oh, like that. That helped to heal me. That helped to heal me. Just the fact that somebody... Have you been there? That somebody would just cry with you. Would just cry with you. That's all I needed. I knew my God was on the throne. I knew my God would see me through. I knew my God is able. I knew all of that. I just needed someone to cry with me. And I was tired of my wife having to do that. And I spoke to my pastor. And my pastor, the pain came out of him. And that helped to heal my heart. Sometimes, guys, when you have a friend who's hurting, and, and, and even if they appear to be forsaking God, and Job speaks of it that way, You have to just sometimes allow them to say, this is where I really am. And you love them because love covers a multitude of sin. It really does. You're not accepting their sin. You're accepting them. They know very often, especially if they've been walking with the Lord, they know if they're wrong. They don't need me to quote a scripture to them saying, this is wrong. What they need is a word that brings healing, a word of understanding. And there are times when people have shared things with me that, I'll be honest with you, I'm thinking, no, no this is wrong. We've got to correct this. I'll be honest with you. But the first thing I need to do is reveal to that person that as a, a human being, I sympathize with you. I care. I care. I care. I don't want that person to stay there. I want them to find a place of relief and, and, and their pain to be healed. I do. But sometimes just tearing up with somebody, sometimes just putting your hand on their shoulder, just nodding your head and just listening. We're living in a time when a lot of people actually need friends like that. And there are friends that are closer than a brother. And we are called to bear one another's burdens. And in doing so, Christ is exalted. And, and Job is speaking to them in this way. And he says, again, to him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brooks that pass away, which are dark because of the ice and into which the snow vanishes. When it is warm, they cease to flow. When it is hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their way turn aside. They go nowhere and perish. The caravans of Tema look. The travelers of Sheba hope for them. They are disappointed because they were confident. They come there and are confused. He's saying, you've been like the water brooks that are mighty in winter, but dry up in summer. Your coming was a ray of hope to me. But your words have brought no comfort. He's saying, you are disappointing to me the way dried up brooks disappoint travelers. They know where the water is, but when they come to drink, the brook is dried up. They expected relief. They expected relief, but were disappointed and ashamed that they were deceived. And that's what you've become. You know, I was looking to you for water, and you've turned out to be just dried up brooks with no nourishment for me at all. In verse 21, for, for now you are, you are nothing. Now you're dried up. You see terror and are afraid. Did I ever say bring something to me or offer a bribe for me from your wealth or deliver me from the enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of oppressors? Look, at you're like that stream. You see me, you become afraid that you might suffer too. 
But did I ever say, bring something to me, offer a bribe for me? Do you think I'm going to ask for financial help or any help from you at all? He says in verse 24, teach me and I'll hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I've erred. How forceful are right words. But what does your arguing prove? Do you intend to rebuke my words in the speeches of a desperate one, which are as wind? Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless and you undermine your friend. Now, therefore, be pleased to look at me, for I would never lie to your face. Yield now. Let there be no injustice. Yes, concede. My righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? So he's making it very clear to them that your arguments lack substance. Not only do their arguments lack substance, but they are insensitive. He's saying you use words that are impressive. I'll listen to words of wisdom, and I'd listen to truth. But by reproaching me, you have erred. In verse 26, you're taking my words and not understanding the pain that produced them. I'm miserable. I'm helpless. I'm hopeless. But you see them as wind without substance. In verse 27, you, you overwhelm the fatherless. You undermine your friend. What's to say? You lack compassion. And because you do, you have increased my pain. You lack compassion. You know, one of the things that helps you to grow in compassion is simply being around people who are hurting. It's a fact. Again, I'll say this, it's just real personal, and I'll say it very quickly. I've, I've prayed that the Lord would help me to have a compassionate heart for many years, and, 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 and I think to some degree that compassion has been formed in my heart, but it wasn't a natural thing at all. And what happened in my case is I began to experience in ministry as a young man things that were very, very difficult. Uh, and, and I don't want to say this in a light way, and I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't come off that way. And it, it may very well forgive me if it does. But I'm thinking of one of the things that the Lord used in my life to help me to understand, to have, to grow, to have compassion, because compassion is, is the ability to feel the pain of somebody else alongside of them. And as a young pastor in this church. We had a funeral for a stillborn baby about 38 years ago. And when I performed that funeral, and I had small babies of my own, when I performed that funeral, my friend Randy, who was one of my assistants, came with me. And after sharing, and I saw the father pick up the casket of his newborn with the body of a little, his little baby, and he carried it, just the daddy. There were no pallbearers. It was just his daddy carrying him, the little boy. And I was watching this father, broken, carrying this little baby in this casket, that hit me in such a profound way, I've never forgotten. I've never forgotten. It hit me in such a deep way that when we walked out of this particular chapel, I couldn't go outside. I had to stand in the foyer. I had to stand in the foyer to gather myself. And my friend Randy, we were young men, guys, in our early 30s. It's not like Older, no, I was a younger man in my early 30s. And my friend is younger than me. And I, I looked at Randy. I looked at my friend. And I, I just shook my head. Because that moved me so deeply that I broke down. I started to sob. My friend Randy took me like I was his, his son. And wrapped me in his arms and held me as I sobbed. 
it was at that point in my life that I know that God was beginning to answer a question, a, a prayer that I had for many years. Father, I want compassion. I don't have it. I want it. And that's that was a breaking point in my life. It really was. Very personal story may not have made sense to you. But I asked the Lord, help me to feel the pain of others. Compassion is something that some people just really need to pray that the Lord will give to them. Because right now there seems to be such an anger in the church towards so much that's wrong that we're losing compassion for those who are lost. And anger seems to be the greater emotion. And, and me, I get angry like anybody else, but I'm asking the Lord God, help me to show compassion to those they don't know you. Jesus, you died on a cross and you said, Father, forgive them. They, they know not what they do. Help me to not become hard towards the pain others feel. Never to justify it, never to say it's okay, never to excuse it, but never to judge them for where they're at too. Because one of the things that went into my coming to faith in Christ was, was I was accepted by those who loved Jesus in such a way that it made me realize that I didn't know the one that they, that they knew. That's what helped to open my eyes. And so what, what Job is simply saying is, I'm miserable and I'm helpless. I'm in such great pain and I'm hopeless. But you're lacking compassion. And because of your lack of compassion, you're increasing the pain that I feel. He says in verses 28 through 30, and I'll close. Therefore, be pleased to look at me, for I would never lie to your face. Yield now. Let there be no injustice. Concede my righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? Look at me. Consider what I've gone through and what I've been brought to. You need to admit that I haven't yielded my walk with God, even after going through such pain. Have I spoken any untruths? Am I not capable of discerning what is right or wrong? Where is your compassion? And that's how he closes this portion of this chapter. Where is it? If I haven't spoken untruth, and if I'm capable of discerning what is right and wrong, then you need to examine your own heart and the way that you're speaking to me. You know, the book of Job is one of the most raw books that you have in the Bible. There are so many things that you see here that you probably can identify with. And we're going to have to leave this at this point. We'll leave Job where he's finally saying, is there injustice on my tongue? We'll pick up next time in verse 1 in chapter 7 because he's not through talking. He's got a few more things to say.